So um, let's begin. You are hit by something with the power to unmake you. Maybe it's the piercing shock of a force from the outside. Maybe it comes from the interior, a dawning consciousness that cuts to the core, shredding at the bindings that bind you together. Maybe it happens all at once, a cacophonous shattering as the self comes apart, is uncomposed, dysregulated in an instant. Or maybe the collapse of comportment creeps across time as you disintegrate in slow motion. Maybe it's a surplus of anxiety the relentless drumming of your heart against the paddings of a fleshy too tight encasement, maybe the surfacing of a million moths, an infinity of distractions woven through with waves of dread and inertia, or maybe a numbness, sinking sensations, dragging you back towards the void, towards a violent blue-black surf of longing lack, towards nothing or towards a will towards nothingness. Maybe it's all of this at once, a surfeit of feelings too many to name, a plenitude of excitation that pushes you past and beyond yourself breaks you past being or breaks you past being you or just breaks you shattered and dissolved. You dissolve into a shudder of breath that can't quite catch, a veil of tears into a wailing, a heaving sob, the moaning gasp, a shudder, shatter and scream. Everybody breaks again and again, full stop. This talk is an attempt to linger in and with grief and the experience of coming undone, shattering, falling apart and breaking down, attending in particular to the significance of such a proposition for queer, feminist and Asian American life. What follows is not meant uh, as a reparative reclamation of grief, melancholia and shattering for queer of color life so much as it's a fundamentally uh, practical proposition. I am arguing for a practice of living and working with the disruptive undoings and depressive drags that accompany queer of color and Asian American grief, not from a want or a desire to linger or live with death or indulge in the chaos of shattering and emotional dysregulation, but because it may nonetheless be necessary to do so in order to work through and live on after, during, and before great loss. Popular clinical uh, and clinical discourses about grief often frame grief as a limited phenomenon that can be worked through and overcome. Grief in this sense is defined as temporally bound, finite, contained, and a containable state, constituting uh, Sigmund Freud's famous and much critiqued binary of mourning versus melancholia. In Freudian mourning, there is a gradual letting go of a loss object as it is replaced with other attachments that facilitate the ability to move on from the undoing of self that a grief state produces. In melancholia, however, there is no letting go of the loss, resulting in a state of endless grieving. This is pathology in Freud's appraisal, since the melancholic is locked within the impasse and hounded by feelings of self-negation, if not a suicidal will towards self-destruction. A good deal of scholarship in queer studies, as well as work in Asian American studies, Latinx studies, and Black studies, and I'm thinking of the work of Jose Munoz, David Eng, and Shin Hee Han, Ann Chang, Jenna Kim, Paul Gilroy, or Ann Svetkovich, among others, have mined the psychically and politically productive necessities and capacities of queer and racial melancholia. Much of this work has unmoored the discussion of melancholia and grief from the individuated framework of psychoanalytic theory to attend to the social and communal dimensions of grief, sadness, depression, and melancholy as they are produced across the intersecting axes of race, gender, sexuality, and class. In what follows, I build upon this body of thought, as well as the work of psychoanalyst Avgi Sakatopolo, to track a queerly Japanese-American practice of living and working with grief and depression, which is also to learn to live with destruction, death, and the effects of psychic and emotional shattering. In order to do so, uh, in order to do so, I bring the tools of queer theory and Asian American studies in particular to bear on a historically grounded overview of the work and life of Yoko Ono. My remarks today are drawn from a developing book on the theme of queer love and loss, a study of artists whose work explores the queer contours of grief. What follows is called from the second half of a chapter on Yoko Ono. The first half of that chapter tracks the thematics of death, destruction, and loss in Ono's work during the 1950s and 60s, when she established herself as a significant figure in the performance art, experimental composition, and conceptual art scenes of the mid-century, alongside collaborators and friends, including John Cage, Yvonne Rayner, Nam Jun Paik, Shige Kokoboda, and Charlotte Mormon. While I do not make an identitarian claim regarding Ono and queerness, the first half of the chapter argues that she nonetheless occupies a queer position in both Asian American studies and art history. I situate that argument within the context of a life that begins with a childhood that was spread between the US and Japan, 
her survival of the air raids of Tokyo in 1945 as a child, and her subsequent migration to the US in the 1950s as she navigated the racist and sexist environs of mid-century New York. I'll begin in the middle today, exploring Ono's intentional meta metabolization of grief and loss, both personal and collective, in her practice from the late 60s through the 80s, grounding her practice in the relational dynamics of performance and the work of the imagination the spectator is often invited into an experience of living with death and working with grief and loss, if not turning oneself over to the breakdown, the shatter, and the scream. Movement one, the scream. A scream can be the sign of a breakdown. A scream can be the breakdown. Often instinctive, a scream surfaces when an excitation of feeling and sensation from fear and rage to joy, pleasure and pain surges up and the bindings come loose. A scream is formed when air is pushed out of the lungs and through the vocal cords with maximal intensity. Screams break beyond the stabilizing norms of typical speech with the capacity for modulation at higher, multiple and often irregular frequencies. During normal speech, the vocal folds are stable and synchronized, but when screaming, they can create what biologists describe as deterministic chaos, making noise out of non-periodic, irregular vibrations. In screaming, words can fall away, unbound, as the free form of noise takes over. But even without language, screams can be efficiently communicative. Screams commonly function within a specific acoustic range that activates the amygdala, the brain center for processing fear, reaching out from the throat of the person screaming and into the brain of those who can hear. By breaking down into chaos then, screams can speak, screams can push back and against. Screams were an infamous component of Ono's repertoire by the end of the 1960s, but they had been there since the beginning. In Jill Johnson's 1961 review of one of Ono's first performances at the Village Gate in New York, Johnson described, described, and this is a quote, amplified sighs, breathing, gasping, retching, screaming, and other tones of pain and pleasure throughout the performance. In one of Ono's instruction pieces dated to 1961, Voice per, for Soprano, Ono stages the, stages the scream as an act of feminist antagonism, directing a soprano to scream, one, against the wind, two, against the wall, three, against the sky. Written in the imperative, Ono's instruction pieces would consist of a sentence or a cluster of sentences, directing a reader to perform an act either physically or in the imagination. A name for a vocal range associated with the upper registers of feminine vocality in her paradigmatic form, the soprano performs within a problematically hyper-idealized mode of femininity. She sounds light as air, but this effect is produced through rigorous training and technique as she undergoes a retinue of ascesis and sacrifice to meet the demands of a repertoire that is usually or historically written by a man. But just as the soprano is linked to the specter of female embodiment, it can also destabilize the fixity of gender and sex. The soprano can be embodied from the queer domain of boy singers and castrati, just as her voice has been a site of identification for queer and trans being and becoming. For the soprano, femininity is signified through the performative technique of the voice's manipulation rather than the determinist determinism of biological sex or gender. Positing the soprano's scream as a mode of antagonism, Ono's scream names and unmakes or shatters gender in the same gesture. A scream can surface as an act of self-possessed agency, but it can also be a sign of shattering when a seemingly coherent self or selves break down into fragments and shards. The notion of shattering has had significant prominence in queer theory following Leo Bersani's description of self-shattering, which occurs when a certain threshold of intensity is reached, when the organization of the self is momentarily disturbed by sensations or affective processes somehow beyond those connected with psychic organization. This surplus of feeling and sensation pushes the self beyond its containment and organization as the self shatters apart. The sexual can be a way of producing this excess of excitation, which can lead to what Jacques Lacan describes as jouissance, a kind of giving over to and going beyond where pleasure gives way to pain as ecstasy and suffering exceed each other and explode or shatter the self. The notion of shattering that most compels my argument here is drawn from the work of contemporary psychoanalyst Avgi Sakatopoulou. 
Sacatopolo notes the familiar resemblance between the Bersanian description of shattering and Jean Laplanche's concept of e the ego's unbinding. In the latter, the bindings that hold the self together are produced as the self translates and tries to make sense of the world. The binding of the ego can emerge, Sakatopolo suggests, when a shat the unbinding of the ego can emerge, Sakatopolo suggests, when a shattering of the self occurs, affecting a radical unbinding of the ego that unravels previous translations that may be at an impasse to make room for new ones. A state of psychic dysregulation, what I'm describing as shattering or coming undone, is one in which a state of emotional and psychological overwhelm, in Sakatopolo's terms, takes place, moving the participant outside of language into inchoate space that is outside of representation. And that last little bit is a quote. For Sakatopolo, such states of dysregulation can offer a condition of possibility. Within this state of dysregulation, a person may come up with new ways of translating their experiences with trauma to be able to craft new meanings and bindings through which they can navigate the once and future force of traumatic rupture. While Sakatopolo cautions that new doesn't necessarily mean more truthful or better, indeed, the new bindings may ultimately be the stuff of psychosis, she nonetheless insists that the capacity to develop a process for working with trauma as an ongoing force in life, rather than attempting to overcome or get beyond it, can offer a pathway to other ways of being and living with, before, and after the shattering. I mean to suggest here that Ono's invitation to enter her scream as her voice cracks and breaks apart is also an invitation to join her in a state of dysregulation from which new ways of negotiating and living with trauma and loss can emerge. One in which living on becomes possible not by escaping trauma, grief, or loss, but instead by learning to function and live with their recurrent and durational, if not recurrently shattering force. Where Johnson's review of Ono's 1961 concert called on racist language to describe Ono's vocality as foreign gibberish, that's from the review. It seems to me that her screams were precise and articulate regarding the need to name a self that could expand beyond and against the limits of a world that was constraining her. Constraints that were often for Ono overdetermined and animated by the forces of racism and sexism. By the late 1960s, she had established herself as a critical figure in the avant-garde of New York, Tokyo, and London. She became something of a cause celeb in London when the British Board of Film Censors banned uh, film number four, AKA Flux Film 16 or Bottoms, a film composed of a series of close-ups of the naked butts of Ono's friends. It was around this time that boy band member John Lennon sought her out, coming to her solo exhibition at London's Indica Gallery. And her collaboration with Lennon was a source of deep inspiration and innovation. And I should say right now that the second half of this chapter um, needs to attend to Ono and Lennon's relationship. But in the full chapter, we're about 30 pages in before Lennon's name even comes up. And I just want to note that to say that he's really not at the center of this. Um, and he's present as her collaborator. I'm uniquely disinterested in John Lennon. Um, their work together on a series of jointly produced records in the late 60s, this is the cover of their first record, which was also uh, face censorship, um, exploit her continued interest in shattering the limits of what music could be. In their collaborations, they incorporated the sounds of everyday quotidian life from an intimate conversation to a radio or TV broadcast. These elements were folded through with oblique, personal, sonic, and corporeal references often supplied by Ono, including her voice as she screamed, spoke, and moaned. Lennon's capacities with the guitar gave her something to play with and against, and as Edward M. Gomez has written, Ono was forced to scream louder than ever against the amplified instruments. At times, the sound of her voice and Lennon's ferocious guitar work fused. Indeed, there are moments in songs like Cambridge 1969 or Why, when the fry in her scream folds into the crash of chords emitting from his guitar. She comes undone in the scream and breaks apart as the function, and, uh, and he breaks apart the function of the guitar to make it into a technology of shattering noise. For Ono, this breakdown provided both a means for being and becoming anything. When I started to scream, I think John thought, oh, I can do anything. I would hear his guitar and think, wow, I can answer that. There was a resonance then between the unbinding of self that comes in the scene of shattering and the capacity to bind the self back together into someone, anyone, new. 
where their first album, 1968's Unfinished Music Number no. 1, Two Virgins, was marked by a playful insouciance, 1969's Unfinished no Music Number no. 2 is an intense meditation on angst and grief. It was a period marked by loss and upheaval, both personal and political. The United States continued to wage war in Asia. It was against the backdrop of the Vietnam War that her association with Lenin emerged into public, the public spotlight. The British and US public responded to their beloved messiah of working class white masculinity's marriage to a Japanese woman from the fringes of the cultural avant-garde with animus and derision. Words like chink, jap, river kwai, and nip floated liberally in the air through which she walked, and all measures of racist stereotypes were employed in press accounts and images of Ono. Once, a group of Lenin fans approached her with a bouquet of yellow roses, placing them in her hands with the thorns still attached to cut her. Only later would she realize that the yellow flowers were meant, as a, um, were meant to signify as a racial slur, uh, and she would later record a song, Yellow Girl. In the fall of 1968, leaving a courthouse after Lenin was arraigned on a likely bogus drug charge, the assembled crowd screamed racist epithets at Ono as they pulled on her hair and at her body. Around this time, she became pregnant, and by November, she was hospitalized. She lost the baby. Unfinished music number two has a range of open meanings, but one can construct an abstract narrative regarding their grief over the miscarriage and their bemused rage at their treatment by the public. The album's cover featured a photo of Ono convalescing in bed. Unable to secure a hospital bed, Lennon slept on the floor beside her where he is crumpled in a pile. They both look disconsolate. The album's lead track, Cambridge 69, features Ono's mundulating own moans overlain with piercing shrieks and cries amidst the dynamic acrobatics of Lennon's guitar. On the second track, No Bed for Beetle John, she sings the text from a tabloid article from the couple's uh, stay, about the couple's stay in the hospital. And here's a few seconds of that. is being kept under observation. The song recalls a Gregorian chant for a morning vesper as she intones the lyrics across monotonal pitches, stretching a single phoneme over a chain of notes. Lennon also chants quietly in the background, coming in and out of focus as the lyrics describe the couple's hospital stay before it speculates on the viability of Ono's ultimately doomed pregnancy. However it felt to read a tabloid account filled with the intimate details of a period filled with profound grief, Ono and Lennon present the song as a kind of bemused prayer one that concludes with the sound of their loss when the death of the child takes center stage on the album's third track, Baby's Heartbeat. This song begins with a brief snippet of playful, muted banter between Ono and Lennon before being promptly interrupted by a little recording of the child's heartbeat. A manifestation of the instruction piece, Beat Piece, which read, listen to a heartbeat, the track continues for approximately five minutes, immersing the listener in the saturated fluid rhythms of the baby's heart, and then the heart abruptly stops, plunging the album into silence with the aptly named fourth track, Two Minutes Silence. The album's last track, Radio Play, is an exercise in endurance. For 12 minutes, the sonic eruptions of a static-laden uh, static radio cut in and out at sharp intervals across the largely indecipherable sounds of Ono and Lennon's domestic soundtrack and a reminder of the punctuated, sometimes irritating and banal forms of everyday living that inevitably follow the shattering force of loss and grief. In 1968, she performed with free jazz legend Ornette Coleman during his concert at the Royal Albert Hall in London. Coleman was a fitting collaborator for Ono's avant-garde vocal techniques. A studio rehearsal of their performance of Ono's AOS included 1970s Yoko Ono Plastic, uh, was included on 1970s Yoko Ono Plastic Ono Band. The trap begins as a conversation between the artists as Ono extends a series of tones across the squeak and squirt of Coleman's trumpet. Following a passage through total silence, Ono begins to affect an erotically charged moan. Their improvisation subtly build to a near crest before she pulls them back, muttering, not yet. Not yet. The command recalls a lover's admonition during sex, a plea to hold off on the shattering force of the sexual lingering in the relay of excitation and duration. 
In a handwritten note to Coleman, she described this plan, establishing herself as the guiding force. Let's gradually go up. Don't go up too quickly. Listen to me. I will try to control you from going up. Awkward breaks that are caused by that are part of the music. The musician, led by Ono's cooing moan, builds into an erotic tensity that shifts from the sound of an orgasmic shudder into a series of punctuated violent screams. <laughs> Her voice shrieks against the instruments until a lot of them crash into a series of exhausted murmurs. The passage recalls the famous apotheosis of Max Roach and Abby Lincoln's triptych prayer protest piece from Roach's revolutionary 1960 Freedom Now suite to which Coleman also contributed. Lincoln's screams on the album have long been a central site of analysis and performance studies, perhaps most famously in the work of Fred Moten and Danielle Goldman. And we're gonna listen just to a second of uh, Lincoln screaming. Moten has located in Lincoln's screams an echo of the screams of the enslaved and the scream of enslaved Black maternity vis-a-vis -vis Frederick Douglass's famous account of the screams of Aunt Hester. You cannot help but hear the echo of Aunt Hester's scream as it bears, Moten writes, at the moment of articulation, a sexual overtone, an invagination, constantly reconstituting the whole of the voice, the whole of the story, redoubled and intensified by the mediation of years, recitations, and auditions. And I should note that Aunt Hester is being beaten by the slave master, Anthony, um, during that sequence. I do not know if Ono was aware of freedom now, in all events, Ono's collaboration with Coleman can be put into conversation with Roach and Lincoln's exploration of the racialized and gendered dynamics of screaming. This is not to flatten Ono and Lincoln's screams, which are differentiated by separate histories of racialization and ungendering, so much as it is to listen to the way Ono's screams compound with Lincoln's, articulating the intensification of other intimate histories of Black and Asian becoming, against the violent forces of misogyny, as well as anti-Black and anti-Asian animus. Marked by both the sexual overtone and an invagination constantly reconstituting the whole of the voice, the act of screaming in Ono and Coleman's collaboration suggests another possible history of Asian and Black undoing and remaking in the face of and against the forces that constrained them both. Screams are also everywhere present on Ono's debut solo album, 1970s Plastic Ono Band. So we'll listen to a section from that. <laughs> On the lead track, why, Ono screams, shuddering and shrieking while returning again and again to only one word, why. There is a rhythm, pulse, and intensity to her vocality that sounds the way intense anxiety can feel, a frenetic darting in multiple directions at once, as well as concentrated obsession with a question that can't be solved or answered, which explodes into a kind of unraveling. In turn, the album's third track offers a sonic portrait of grief's durational, recurrent, and resounding wail. The track consists of a single line of text, which also doubles as a title, Greenfield Morning, I Pushed an Empty Baby Carriage All Over the City. The title makes a series of important revisions to a poem Ono published in 1960s, also titled Greenfield Morning. And that poem is, reads, Greenfield Morning, Women Pish Pushed baby, Empty Baby Carriages All Over the City. The subject of the poem here has shifted from women to Ono's eye, and rather than multiple baby carriages, there's only one now, and she is pushing it. The song is divided into three movements. Ono recovered an unwanted scrap of recording from Lennon's sessions featuring Lennon on guitar, Ringo Starr on drums, and George Harrison on sitar. In the first movement, she layers her voice over a loop of Harrison's droning sitar as she slowly sings the song's title. She used a tape loop to layer her voice and create an echo effect. 
In the second movement, she slows the vocals down to drop her voice an octave. The shift in the octave affects a literal reconstitution of the gendered erotics of Ono's voice. Gender is made transitive here, such that the first time I heard the song, I thought Lennon was laying down the vocals. Listening in detail, however, it became clear that the vocals precisely match the phrasing and cadence of the first movement, having been produced through the technological manipulation of Ono's voice. As with Ono's uh, voice piece for a soprano, the fixity of gender is unraveled and reconstituted at the eventual site of the throat. So this is from the second movement. The song makes use of Ono's interest in the tape loop. The tape loop was a method that had much interested avant-garde composers of Ono's generation, though the manipulation of recorded tape is largely associated with a host of West Coast musicians, including Steve Reich and musicians associated with the San Francisco Tape Music Center, founded by Ramon Sender and Morton Sabotnik, and then later famously directed by Pauline Oliveros. The tape loop technique has, uh, had barely begun to surface in popular music, if at all, when Ono deployed it on Plastic Ono Band. In a fashion similar to Reich's, ono Ono's deployment of the tape loop created a layered and pulsing effect, transforming her voice into a chorus of wailing specters. She deployed the tape loop to transform recorded sound into a new sound and rhythm. Stars, drums, and Lennon's guitar gave the song a cyclical durational effect, just as the tape loop transforms the rhythm of the clip in the second section, remaking it into a syncopated trippy beat. Uh, and her son has noted that in a lot of ways, it sounds a lot closer to a hip hop beat of the later uh, 80s and 90s. Um, as her voice builds throughout, it spills over into a haunting drone. The lyrics are barely perceptible as the moan and grind of the instruments wash up on the shore of the third movement, which is birds chirping, um, a sound that was used often in Ono's composition. Across her prolific body of recorded work in the late 60s and early 70s, Ono constructed immersive sonic explorations of the complex range of shattering feelings that accompanied the forms of loss she both endured and lived through. Drawing the listener into an intimate relationship with the wail of the mourning mother on songs like Cambridge 1969 or Don't Worry Kyoko, a song in which she kind of screams over and over again, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry to her daughter Kyoko. And she was recording um, the four different recorded versions of that song during a period in which her ex-husband Anthony Cox effectively kidnapped Kyoko. Um, and she didn't see Kyoko again from the time that she was a young child until she was an adult. Um, or Greenfield Park, I pushed an empty baby carriage all over the city. Ono walked her listener to the threshold of losses depths. Screaming and unmaking the forms with which she worked, she offered a lesson in and an experience of the power of coming undone, falling apart and losing it. At the same time, she insisted on showing how creative work can be forged from loss, if for no other reason than to work through the recurrent effects of a shattering. Movement two lingering in the impasse. On December 9th, 1980, John Cage sent a message to Ono on behalf of himself and his partner, choreographer Merce Cunningham. Written in Cage's angular flowing handwriting and addressed to Yoko Ono Lennon, the message says simply, Dear Yoko, if there's anything we can do for you, let us know. We send our love, John and Merce. The austerity of Cage's note belies the thickness of the feeling saturating the paper it's recorded on, Cunningham and Cage were famously quiet regarding the relatively open secret of their relationship and queerness. But here, in the fold of an intimate exchange with an old friend, John and Merce are a simple we at ease with its outward address to Yoko's singularity, a we collectively offering itself as a queer source of love, a we that waits on a friend to know, and a we that makes a stark and absolute offer of anything without condition. The night before, she was in the studio with Lennon working on one of her songs, Walking on Thin Ice. The song is a driving rock anthem laced with an air of eerie paranoia and foreboding dread. Walking on thin ice. Her voice creeps across the lyrics to forge a desperate, urgent, erotically charged whisper that cracks and breaks apart, apart amidst a narrative of a woman caught in a dynamic of risk and precarity. 
At various intervals, the driving force of his guitar rears up from the depths with a series of strident dissonant chords like ice cracking. Against and over this, she layers a rhythmic piercing shriek. The sense of dread underscoring the song proved uncannily prescient that night. As they were coming home from the studio and moving towards the entrance of the Dakota, the stately apartment building where they lived with their five-year-old son, Sean, at the corner of 72nd and Central Park West, a man emerged holding a copy of Double Fantasy, Ono and Lennon's comeback album, which had been released a month prior. The man shot Lennon five times, murdering him in front of her. It is reported that she let out a scream, screaming John's been shot. I don't know whether Ono issued a personal response to the condolence note from Cage and Cunningham, but in March of 1982, they received, or at least their archives hold, a form letter printed on stationery from Studio One, Ono's offices at the Dakota. The Ono Lennons had been forging a synecdocal relationship between themselves and the building for years. As early as the mid late 70s, the Lennon Ono's letterhead featured this drawing of the building. In the letter from 1982, the rendering was blown up to occupy the full bottom third of the stationery, giving one a clear view of the space where Lennon was shot on the street. Ono's note speaks of renewal and endurance. In celebrating the arrival of spring, Sean and I would like to thank you for thinking of us and taking your time and sending a part of you in the past year. Your words came to us sometimes like a soft breeze, sometimes like a strong wind, all helping both of us to grow happier and wiser. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We wish you a happy spring. Love, Yoko and Sean. The emphasis on spring is an extension of Ono's longstanding interest in the seasons. She would often assign seasons to the instruction pieces. In an interview from 2012, she described spring in particular as the beginning of things. But the emphasis on spring here also harkens to a poem that she published in 1981. Released six months after the assassination by Geffen Records on June 3rd, Ono's solo, solo album, Season of Glass, is a staggering metabolization of her grief in the wake of the assassination. And the following poem was published on the album's back cover. Spring passes and one remembers one's innocence. Summer passes and one remembers one's exuberance. Autumn passes and one remembers one's reverence. Winter passes and one remembers one's perseverance. There is a season that never passes, and that is the season of glass. Beginning with spring, the lyric accounts for the passing of various seasons before underscoring the durational, lingering dimensions of grief as she describes the season of glass as one that never passes. As it emphasizes the recurrent and ephemeral trajectory of the seasons, the lyric also suggests the cyclical nature of existence. If spring is a beginning, it is also simultaneously an ending. The season that never passes in turn is the season of glass, which lingers in the threshold between holding it together and shattering apart. The album's cover confronts the listener with the raw expression of Ono's grief by way of a square photographed tableau of a pair of glasses and a glass of water full to the halfway mark. Both glass objects are placed evenly on a slightly reflective tabletop. Behind and refracted through them is a view of Central Park and the Upper East Side on the other side of a window, suggesting that one is viewing this tableau from within Ono's quarters in the Dakota. The question as to whether the glass is half full or half empty is brutally overdetermined by the detail of the glasses. The view of the park is blocked by splattered brown smudges on their right lens. These are the glasses that Lennon was wearing on the night of the murder. Ono's choice to render the cover as a chilling portrait of her silent scream and a violent confrontation with the stakes of an optimist dilemma was met with immediate and enduring resistance. I used a photo I took of John's bloodstained glasses on the record cover. The record company called me and said the record shops would not stock the record unless I changed the cover. I didn't understand it. Why? They said it was in bad taste. I felt like a person soaked in blood coming into a living room full of people and reporting that my husband was dead, his body was taken away, and the pair of glasses were the only thing I had managed to salvage, and people looking at me saying it was in bad taste to show the glasses to him. I'm not changing the cover. This is what John is now, I said. This is what John is now. His life and being, after the violent rupture of his murder, is still a continuing presence in the present tense of her unfolding now. With the image, Ono asks us to linger in the ambiguous horizon of this scenario in which life and death, love and loss, living and grieving are folded together into a coterminous event 
that structures her sense of the unfolding now. Ono prevailed, securing the release of the cover, which resulted in more public criticism. In a condescendingly positive, if brief, review of the album for the New York Times, Robert Palmer, who was one of the few music critics to take Ono seriously as a musician, reflects the fact that the album directly and sometimes brutally confronts her grief while reserving the balance of his column to chide her for this very thing. But the several explicit references to John Lennon's murder are likely to offend fans whose memory of the tragedy is still fresh and who would rather forget the trauma associated with it rather than be reminded of it all over again. Both Record Company and Palmer criticize Ono for confronting Lennon's fans with a trauma they might otherwise want to forget, even though it's a trauma that she actually experienced. With the image, she is reminding us that by virtue of its nature as trauma, she cannot forget however much she might like to. She and we will have to find a way to live with it. The recto side of the cover for Season of Glass stages a portrait of Ono lingering in a depressive tableau, again staged within the Dakota. She pulls the frame back from the cover image so that we can now see the full window lined with shutters. The glass still rests on the table, but it's nearly full of water. Lennon's glasses are gone and have been replaced by a small flowering potted plant, suggesting life's growth from a space inhabited and haunted by death. Haunting the margins of the image's right side, Ono sits in profile and silhouette. Her presence at the edge of the image large, largely fades into the dark shadows of the interior and offers the photo a depressive edge. She appears to be sitting in the place where darkness and light meet, and it's unclear whether where her gaze is fixed, as if she's pondering not the glass and flower in front of her, but the darkness itself. Ono's decision to linger in this ambiguous space where life and death or living and grieving are co-present with each other, as well as her insistence that the state is an impasse or a season that never passes, lends the album a distinctly melancholic air. In ways, Ono's invitation is akin to Anne Sebekovich's appeal to queer and feminist theory to let depression linger. It might be important to explore the feelings of remaining or resting in sadness without insisting that it be transformed or reconceived. But through an engagement with depression, we might find a way to forms of hope, creativity, and even spirituality that are intimately connected with experiences of despair, hopelessness, and being stuck. Such a mode of living with depression or lingering in the impasse becomes for Svetkovich a passage towards new and unrealized forms of sociality and being with and within the fold. If we can come to know each other through our depression, then perhaps we can use it to make forms of sociability that not only move us forward past our moments of impasse, but understand impasse itself to be a state that has productive potential. As helpful as this conception of the impasse is, Svetkovich ultimately orients her theory towards the notion that one may be capable of moving, quote, forward past our moments of, of impasse, end quote. This movement for Svetkovich um, finds expression in acts of creativity. And I do want to suggest that it is uh, reflected by the fact that Season of Glass was made at all. At the same time, part of what I find compelling about Ono's image is the suggestion that the impasse may not, in the final instance, be something that can be triumphed against, overcome, or moved past. The creative labors of Season of Glass emerge not as a way of getting over the impasse, but from the act of lingering with and within it. Years later, Ono's adult son, Sean, was asked by Rolling Stone why he and his mother lingered in the Dakota after his father would mur was murdered, as if like a five-year-old would have a say in that. Um, he replied, it would have been a lot stranger to run away. The Dakota was all we had left of him, memories and everything. How could we leave? Elsewhere, he offers a portrait of their grieving, emphasizing his mother's depressive lingering in bed. I didn't find out until a few days later. I had to go into the bedroom and my mom was in bed. She'd obviously been in bed for a few days. She said, your dad's dead. She said it really straight up like that. He's been killed. Not wanting to make her responsible for his grief, the five-year-old retreats to his bedroom before slamming the door uh, slamming the door, throwing myself on the floor, and crying and crying. I think for days I cried. Just as Ono stays in bed with her son, uh, just as Ono stays in bed for days and days, her son cries for days and days. These two seemingly differential portraits of grieving, both emphasizing duration as a component of both, just as both give into the shattering force of the breakdown. And in a 1997 CD reissue of Season of Glass, she included this picture of her and Sean at the time of the death in bed. 
Um, the act of lingering in bed is a paradigmatic, even cinematic image of a depressive state. It's telling the degree to which the act of staying in bed appears at the center of the Ono's joint narratives of this period. The son's memory places the bed at the narrative center of his portrait of her grief, and the mother too centered the bed in her recollections. John was dead, but John's side of the bed was still warm when I came back from the hospital. My side was cold, I was shivering. It was as if John were still alive. To linger in bed for days then was to linger in bed with his absence. This is further underscored in Ono's narrative of the genesis of I Don't Know Why, Season of Glasses' fifth track. The song came to my mind about two nights after John was shot. I was in bed trying to close my ears to the sound of John's records being played loudly outside the Dakota building by fans, especially Imagine. Here, the impasse of his death crashes up against an unfolding now in which Ono is caught lingering in bed with the loss of him while being sensorially assaulted by the omnipresent sound of his voice. Rather than leaving the bed or the Dakota, however, she lingers there, writing uh, her way through the trauma from within the site of the impasse. I need to emphasize that I'm not making an argument that one should just stay in bed forever, although like maybe. Um, following Sakatopolo, a shattering isn't permanent and from within its wake, a person can forge new bindings from within the site of an impasse. But what I am saying is that in the wake of a shattering experience with loss, rather than pushing oneself or others to move on and pass the loss, we might take time to linger within the impasse to figure out how to move, if not past the impasse, then with the impasse. In this way, Ono's performance of lingering in the impasse on the cover of Seasons of Glass or in bed in her narrative of its emergence could be akin to the forms of staying in an Asian American asociality that are described by Summer Kim Lee. Lee asks how the seemingly passive antisocial act of staying in can shift and reconstellate one's relation to others, to the socialities with which one is entangled, but from the momentary position of being alone as a social. Observing impulses within both queer studies and Asian American studies to draw the minoritarian subject out into the world via the disclosure of self in, in a pursuit of broader relatability, but not always relation, Lee proposes a method of staying in as a mode of asociality that allows for a kind of pause. By staying in, we might give ourselves room to breathe, she writes. Um, and in giving ourselves room to breathe, we might interrogate our relationship to ourselves and the world, working out new horizons of livability and relationality. Importantly, the art of staying in is not a permanent choice so much as it is a question that one can ask and answer differently each time. While my emphasis is on lingering in the impasse, I propose this in alignment with Lee's method to describe a strategy of living with the forms of grief, shattering, and depression that may come with queer and Asian American being. It was by staying in the Dakota and lingering with her grief and loss that Ona was able to move, if not past the loss, then into a place of creative negotiation with it in the studio. In other words, by lingering in the impasse, Ono learned how to live and move with rather than past loss. Movement three, uh, choke and crackle. On the night she lay in bed trying to drown out the sounds of Imagine, she recorded an acapella demo of I Don't Know Why. I did not change one word when I recorded it for the album later. At the time, I envisioned the end part as a half an hour of screaming and swearing, but in the studio, I decided not to do it that way. Critics, including Palmer, noted Ono's shift away from the unbridled screaming and other extreme vocal techniques of her earlier albums on Season of Class, Glass. Certainly, the album's 10th track, No, 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 features the sound of four gunshots and a harrowing scream executed by Ono, a scream that clearly references and reperforms her screams during the assassinations, just as it compounds with the other screams to which we have been listening. Importantly, uh, however, the album features other, softer ways for a voice or a person to shatter and break down. Where Ono shifted away from the durational screaming that she had initially envisioned for Season of Glass, the soft and melancholic vocals of the album still reflect a voice that is broken and breaking. In the liner notes, she admits, when I started to sing, I noticed my voice was all choked up and cracking. After hesitating to continue with the recording, she commits to the crackle and choke. I thought of all the people in the world whose voices were choking and cracking for many reasons. I could sing for them. I could call it a choke or a crackle. Well, wasn't that what the critics had been saying about me for all these years anyway? 
I realized my songs were the songs of the desperate. It was all right to show myself as I was. Ridiculed for years for her screaming, she submits to her broken voice on Season of Glass, inhabiting the choke and crackle as a way of being. She lingers in the queer beauty of breaking down as her choke and crackle compound with and sing in the service of other shattered voices of the desperate. I also hear in the choke and crackle of Ono's voice on Season of Glass, a resonance with another scene of Asian American choking in the wake of racial trauma. In an autoethnographic account of the capacity for creative practice to function as a means of working with and through trauma, anthropologist and performance studies scholar Doreen Kondo tells a story about choking on racial trauma. Kondo is participating in a psychology study regarding the legacies of the Japanese American incarceration, referring to the US government's incarceration of 120,000 Japanese Americans, including Kondo's parents in concentration camps throughout the US interior and on the basis of race during World War II. The lead researcher, Sansei scholar Dona Nagata, asked Kondo if she thinks internment affected you and your family. I started to answer, but I couldn't speak as though if I did, I might choke and break down sobbing. My reaction utterly shocked me. Where did it come from? The sensation of choking felt like a knot at the core of my being, an obstruction as physical as a furball. Indeed, despite the fact that I had been director of the Asian American Studies program and had to speak about internment publicly on occasion, I still cannot speak up about the incarceration for long without the same sensation of choking, choking up. There are multiple valences to Kondo's choke. There is the choke as an expression of affective overwhelm, dysregulation, and coming undone. Kondo is utterly shocked by an autonomic response, choking over which she has no control. But there is also choking on an obstruction, the fur ball that has entered her body, blocking the air and threatening her capacity to breathe. She elaborates on this latter mode of choking as obstruction, as a metaphor for psychic, the psychic effects of incarceration on Japanese Americans. Japanese Americans had to consume, choke down the pains of incarceration, the racial humiliation, the loss of dignity, property, humanity, and the persistence of harassment after the camps. In the face of ongoing hostility and racial humiliation, the choking enacts the dramatic push-pull between choking down the pain that threatens to suffocate and forced by punishments that seek to keep trauma encrypted within the body and involuntarily choking up as the impulses to expel and release. With reference to my discussion uh, earlier regarding Ono's queer placement within narratives of Japanese America, a discussion that I didn't present today, um, it would be clear that I am not arguing that Ono's choke and crackle can be neatly mapped onto the choke that catches in Kondo's throat. But at the same time, it's useful to queer out the queer resonances between them. In Kondo's narrative, as in Ono's personal trauma, compounded with the history of racial trauma, um, the choke bubbles up to take hold of the subject, threatening the disillusion of herself. As in Sakatopolo's theorization of overwhelm and psychic dysregulation, the choke Kondo describes is that moment when the coherent self or ego threatens to dissolve into a dysregulated state of overwhelm. By grounding her narrative in the specificities of the incarceration, Kondo underscores the way such choking and disillusion may manifest in responses to the communal dimensions of racial trauma and anti-Japanese animus described by Kondo, which very much shaped the US to which Ono and her family would migrate both before and after the war. This is to suggest that if Kondo's parents and Ono were on opposite side of the ocean during the war, their chokes might nonetheless have something to do with each other and their differential experiences with racialization as well as the landscape of racial trauma and paradoxical privilege inherent to their differentiated experiences in Japanese America. When describing the choke as a response to racial trauma, Kondo makes useful comparison to Franz Fanon's description of the muscular spasms that occur in folk who have been blackened by the violence of colonization and racialization. These muscular spasms are for Fanon a sign of the ego shattering and undoing. Um, as he describes it, the psyche retracts and is obliterated. Um, in these spasms, the colonized subject forced to take a, uh, forced to a state of overwhelm and dysregulation by the running sore of colonial and racial violence comes undone in and as expressive physical outbursts. Shattering here may also pose a condition of possibility, however, since the undoing of the subject does not necessarily result in the finitude of cessation. 
in a fashion akin to the process described by Sakatopolo, where psychic overwhelm affects the unbinding of the subject and opens up the possibility for new bindings and translations to emerge in response to trauma, Fanon also suggests that psychic shattering can man manifest in dysregulated states, symptomized in muscular spasms that may ultimately lead to the development of revolutionary consciousness. Derek Scott has theorized the muscular spasms in Fanon as an expression of a black power that emerges from and in response to powerlessness. Scott asks, following Fanon, what is it to live in defeat when you must? This surfaces as an art. It makes a kind of optimistic art of despair. It bows perforce to seeming inevitability, that is, the constant failure of our efforts to transform the world along the lines of justice or merely sense. The strangeness of living in a world of such pain and suffering and knowing that it is our world and that therefore the pain and suffering is in some ways our doing. While I must emphasize the differential context from which Fanon and Scott, Kondo and Ono are working, I also sense here a resonance between the optimistic art of despair that Scott locates in Fanon and in the work performed by Kondo and Scott. Just as I think it is useful to recognize the, albeit different, effects of racial and colonial trauma as they affect this art, which emerges in and as the choke, spasm, shatter, and scream. Kondo concedes that choking and rage can be productive, but cannot be an endpoint, seeking a creative means for learning how to access then how to dwell in the pain of the legacies of racial trauma. This might also be a way of describing Ono's inhabitation of the choke and crackle, her willingness to turn herself over to the breakdown and her capacity to linger with death and live with grief, depression, and the traumatic effects of shattering. This optimistic art of despair confronts the ongoing persistence of life in death and death in life from the place of a now that comes before, after, and in the mix of great loss. Epilogue, Toy Boat. 2007 saw the release of a compilation album honoring Ono's long undervalued impress upon the realm of popular music as a series of artists paid tribute to, a, to by remixing and re-recording highlights from her songbook. It's kind of like a who's who of indie rock from like the mid 2000s because it has like Cat Power, La Tigra, The Family, uh, sorry, The Flaming Lips, Peaches. Um, she returned to the season of Glass Archive for Toy Boat, a collaboration with Anoni and Han Ro. Uh, and I'm going to play a short section of that. I'm waiting for a boat to help me out of here. Mm. Waiting for a boat to help me out. The boat that reached my shore was a toy boat. Mm. Waiting for a boat to help me out. She returned to the season of Glass Archive with Toy Boat, in collaboration with Anoni and Han Ro. Anoni's voice, like Ono, stages the reconstitution of gender and self in her articulation of it. One of the most widely recognized trans musicians, especially known for her work with Antony and the Johnsons, Anoni brings an ethereal quality to Ono's song. Toy Boat is one of Ono's tenderest compositions. It's a simple pop song and a cry for help from the space of the impasse as Ono waits for a boat to help me out of here. While reaching out to ask for someone, anyone to help me out, help me out of here, as she sings, Anoni's voice begins to coo and croon beneath her. As if responding to Ono's pleas for help, Anoni floats in to lift her up as they linger in the air together above a queer horizon where they might be and become anyone. In this space, grief, loss, and longing, though recurrent and durational, are allowed to breathe, and they are resolved into a practice of living on, filled with beauty, grace, and even pleasure, ecstasy, and joy, amidst and with great sadness. Here, queer, trans, femme, and Japanese-American ways of being open to and linger together in a sky still full of the possibility of living with, being with, and living on. So, thank you.